Okay, welcome, well. Annika. You It'll get better. Be no, you weren't meant to be like saying anything at all. Oh, anything good. at all. Uh, <laughs> Challenge Annika is returning to our screens this weekend after almost three decades, and we are delighted to welcome <laughs> Annika to the studio. Are why, you? Why are you actually snorting, Jane? No, you only because that was real, and it wasn't Fee's fault. I have to say, but the music was going to come on, then you were going to speak, and it was going to be really brilliant. But as we know, no. But let's um, face it: the last time I met you, yes. we sat on a pavement yes. doing fortunately yes so i'm not used to anything more than and by a, the sounds a, a of it draft neither are we <laughs> <laughs> so i'm rather relieved that you haven't moved on no, oh we really. haven't no. not really we've gone uh, backwards so look you've gone back to this after three decades is it because you'd become one of jeremy hunt's economically inactive people when you've been <laughs> lured back into the workforce no, in it, order to pay it, more tax it didn't, it didn't come it wasn't an idea that came from me and when people say you're lured back remember challenge for me never sort of goes away because I'm still involved with all these projects. I'm very actively involved with some of them, like the Romanian project. So I'm still ticking away quietly, you know, behind the scenes. Um, And it's just that suddenly TV companies um, started approaching me and going, you know, and out of nowhere. So I had various chats along the lines and various broadcasters wanted me to come on with a comedian or a co-presenter or whatever. And it just never quite sat right. And then Darling Ben Frow at Channel 5 just went, I just want the programme as it is. And it was just so refreshing because there was just no, you know, there was just no frills about it. He just said, it works, it's a lovely format, Um, bring it back. And it just tied in with a conversation I was having with uh, Monica McDade, who was the school teacher from Solihull, who set us the Romanian challenge 30 years ago. And I've kept in touch with, and that project's just sort of gone on for 30 years. And these orphans as they were and now young adults living in these sort of halfway houses that the, the charity we set up built for them anyway and that these halfway houses and these very damaged children mostly because they had such a tough start in life you know tethered cots and uh, no hot water no electricity um they where they the charity our charity has now built these halfway houses happens to be on the border with ukraine And so Monica just told me that refugees were coming from Ukraine and I mustn't call them orphans because they're now in their 30s, but they were giving up their beds to the refugees. And it was just such a sort of humanitarian art that it just made me absolutely... I was polaxed by the whole thought of that. And so when, you know, Ben and Channel 5 came forward, it just sort of hit me that that moment where I thought, gosh, that programme... It is worth doing because actually, apart from the TV side of it, you're you're building a project, you're creating something. And are so, any of the challenges in this series quite as ambitious as those original uh, ones back in the eighties and nineties? So ambitious that we just didn't nearly finish them, literally by weeks. But we we show all that because <laughs> we're filming in a recession, apart from anything else. And if anyone who's tried to get some builders to fix something in their kitchen knows, you know, a a there's no materials because of Brexit, and b there's no builders you know all the the companies gone into administration and all those things it was the story of now we were trying to do these very ambitious projects but with the most wonderful charities i have to say like a like a food hub with a cafe and a uh, big teaching kitchen who knew that the word mm. food bank or food hub would be in our bank vocabulary 30 years ago so you know it's really interesting that arc of social history and And are people still as willing to get involved and to to be lured into it just as passers by totally that was what was so touching and people would just come up and sort of stroke dave the sound man's arm you know an utter nostalgia fest and there was one dave. No, dave i mean everyone just loves him so much i don't get a look in it you don't get, i thought you were gonna dave. say i don't get along with him but that wasn't quite what you said i can't no. stand the man <laughs> <laughs> no, but there was one guy, there's a guy called Ronnie Graham, who was a 10-year-old when we did Challenge in Balna Hinch in Northern Ireland, and he sat watching us build this, this creation and thought, that's what I want to do when I grow up. I want to I want to build something that rises out of the dust like that. And he was the architect on our Food Hub programme. Oh, wow. How bizarre. And that happened so much with all the programmes that we can't even put it all in the programme because it just sounds like a nostalgia fest. Mm. 
there's no time for anything else if we put all those bits there in. are some I mean, we've only been allowed to see the very first episode Annika but there are there's some very self-deprecating bits where you ring people up and they, they haven't heard of I Challenge haven't Annika haven't got a clue <laughs> haven't got a clue <laughs> have you heard of Challenge Annika no no, no. I, I say how old are you 30 right is there anyone slightly older on the switchboard today <laughs> Could take my call. You know, but you know, that's the glorious thing about it. Um, you know, a lot of people came along because they, they watched. They're my age, and they watched and want to come and vol- You know, get involved. And then there were people who were patently grandchildren. <laughs> people our age, but it was sort of glorious. It was just glorious, I have to say. Mm. Uh, we're going to talk some more to Annika and we're very happy to hear your questions to 8722 start your message with the word time so- why do we just laugh when we see each other I don't, I don't know <laughs> but you're right Jane's having some guffaws over there <laughs> and I'm not sure what Party that's about guffaws. during the commercial break she guffawed me out of the room practically mm. what's going on do you get a bit annoyed or upset about continual references to your age Ooh look, it's a 60-something woman on television. It is It is always the tagline, isn't yeah. it? I know there's been a lot of publicity and it is sort of... But actually, um, as I say, with the with the, with the with my dealings with Channel 5, it, it's never been mentioned. It's slightly the elephant in the room, but no one ever mentions how actually ancient Dave, the sound man, <laughs> I laughed. But, you know, we're still... You know, the thing is, you don't change as you get older. I've still got energy and whatever. You know, we look different. You know, people have just got to get over that. But also, do Um, you think it is different for women? I mean, there are loads and loads of 60-something, 70-something men uh, just acing it on television. There are mm. far fewer women. There are far fewer women. And I think the real struggle for women is um, holding on to their identity, keeping that intact. And it, it sort of has to subtly change, it seems to be, for women, if you want to carry on. I mean, David Attenborough is still abseiling off ice peaks. Talking to he? Puffins and he's, when he's 97. 97 yeah. or whatever. Um, the Rolling Stones have just had their 60 tour. Mm. No, you know, there's a few sort of comments, but on the whole... Well, there are some comments, (laughs) let's be honest. So I think everybody, you know, as you get older, you you do get the comments. But I was particularly pleased because uh, Treasure Hunt, uh, the series I did before Challenge, was exactly 40 years ago and Challenge 30. So it's a lovely bookend to my career. You know, just a a nice chance to do something... um, just to tie up, tie up all the yeah. loose ends because there were loose ends with Challenge because it's still people still talk about it so much so it seemed like there was something there still to, to explore. We have a text in. Oh, um, do you? Yes, Jill Look says. Look at you, Jane. I know. I can Tech. Do... <laughs> Annika, please, I can read out loud. I've been able to, to do that. Well, actually, no, I can't even do that all that well these days. But anyway, uh, Jill says, I live in Annika's hometown of Oxted. Oh. And my friends who knew her as a child and teenager say she's always been a lovely person. Oh. <laughs> Just thought I'd put a jeopardy there. No, um, a lovely person. No, that's lovely. Thank you for that, Jill. Thank you. Yeah, that's very kind. That's... It's not very controversial, no, but it's interesting, uh, isn't it? it? Yeah. I, there's not a lot more I can give without knowing more about Jill. No, I but mean, it's... Had I known more, but it's a nice start. Might give people the idea that you know, are, there could be a bit right. of... To and fro with this conversation. Can we um, talk a little bit about your relationship with the BBC? Because it's been up and down over the years, hasn't it? Oh, well, uh, I suppose uh, it was all, you know, I did my tra- training course at the BBC 46 years ago. Mm. So I'm me and Tony Blackburn must be the two <laughs> longest serving BBCers in existence. And so you do imagine you might get a bit of a sort of fountain pen at Christmas or mm. some acknowledgement. And, I, you know, it is it is has it is tricky. I mean, the, the worst bit was when I lost my breakfast show on Radio 2 with two weeks' notice, you know, having done it for over ten years. And they, I just got a call from my agent saying, you're not doing it from two weeks' time. And I, and I actually was in a sofa shop at the time, and I remember sitting on the sofa shop and just crying, and I couldn't leave the shop. It was quite embarrassing. Because I was so shocked, because, you know, what people don't realise as employers that... Take, just th- taking something away very quickly. Mm. Um, you know, that's the structure of your life. That all these structures are really important to people in employment, aren't they? But and did nobody some... from the BBC contact you? No. No, I just heard from my agent. Yeah, no, that was disappointing. So I did lose that. So that was very sad. Mm. But 
you know, maybe that maybe that happens everywhere. I don't know. Uh, well, it probably doesn't reflect on me. It was, but I, and then I thought, oh well, that doesn't matter because, of course, what's going to happen is that they're going to give it to maybe a younger feisty woman, and I was all sort of up for that. I thought, fair enough. I've you know, I've been around a long time. That's fine. And then it wasn't. It, you know, it was. It, it went to a, a, a lovely person, Dermot O'Leary, who I absolutely adore. But um, he's many things, but he's not a young, feisty woman, He's not he? a young, feisty no. woman. So that was more the shock, because I did think, oh, well, fair enough, I, this is fine, how exciting, I, you know, good. Mm. And then it, it wasn't that. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't say that with any malice or upset, really, because it's, it's just what it is, isn't it? And it might happen to any of us. And do you think that you would handle being a young woman very well had you been born an awful lot later? So let's say you were a 20-something, 30-something at the moment. Mm. Do you think you would have fared well in the social media no. buzz of the world? No, I'm, I'm so oversensitive, it's, it's ridiculous. So I would be absolutely hopeless. I don't even, you know, I, I am on Twitter... And I am on Instagram, but I don't... If you if you look at my followers on Instagram, I follow things like big windows mm. oh, that's and nice. kitchens. Yeah. I don't want to know what anyone else is doing. I don't want to be part of that competitive world. Do you know what, what I mean? What, the people are always having a good time? They're all having such a lovely time in a glass mm. of wine. They've got loads of friends. Loads <laughs> yes. of friends. For that reason, I do follow you too. Yeah, well, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I know very well. <laughs> I'm going to put that on my gravestone. <laughs> it was me and big windows. <laughs> but it's an interesting it, no, thing, I, though, isn't it? Because yeah. I think it does uh, add a huge pressure to all of our uh, working worlds, actually, when we don't really necessarily understand all of the technology, understand all of those pressures. Mm. There's a whole other thing oh, we're no. having to conquer my, as well as coming to work niece, to do the job. I remember, I haven't got daughters. I had, I, had I had daughters, I might be terrified. But actually, my sons have just skipped that generation mm. of, of social media hysteria they're almost bookish in their disinterest in that whole world um but had i you know as you say if i was of a different generation i just don't think i could cope with it i you know i've heard from young girls who who put up a, something on their social media instagram on their school thing the big schools with maybe hundreds in their class. And if, if they don't get 100 likes, they literally can't go into class that morning. Uh, you know, and it's really tough. And I work for a charity where I, I, I'm in a call centre talking to people who've got real issues. Oh, my goodness, it, this is such an issue for young people. It's, it's terrifying. It's a self-esteem thing. It's a yeah, self-esteem, the lack of it. The lack of it. Yeah. And, you know, all of us, we just bumbled along in our careers and were very lucky to sort of hit hit moments where we got employed but had no idea whether anyone liked us or not it just was, was largely irrelevant it was just you got on with your job didn't you yeah you are the queen of self-deprecation though when we met before and um, we did an interview with you for our previous podcast uh, you told a hilarious story <laughs> about uh, the way that your waxwork had been melted oh, down yes. when you were no longer yeah. popular enough to form a queue in Madame Two Swords and you've ended up where? In Wookie Hole? Just the head? Oh, it's, it's, it, it was very funny because I was hanging for quite a long time in the foyer of Madame Tussauds, just swaying gently because I was on a, on a rope ladder. In a in jumpsuit. In a jumpsuit, of yeah. course, of mm. course. And with headphones on and a map during Treasure Hunt. And then when then I had a reincarnation challenge, they just put a paintbrush in my hand and I carried on swaying. <laughs> and Channel 4 came round to talk to me about, um, you know, how what a pre prestige to be you know, put in Madame Tussauds and I stood there rather smugly, I have to say. And then they said, and how do you feel now you've been melted down? That was the first I'd heard of it. It's a bit like Radio 2 all over again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing all these things from the wrong people. people. Well, well, actually, BBC we have been called. asked to tell you... No, it's all right. No, you, they, they thought it'd be better if you heard it from us this afternoon, yes. Annick. Can so, we just share but, it with anyone else? Perhaps? But can we just complete the anecdote? Because otherwise people oh, yes. will be thinking that I've gone mad. Your head ended up in Wookie, <laughs> Wookie Hole. Well, if you Google Wookie Hole, you will see these shelves in a cave somewhere off the M5 um, of the decapitated heads from mm. Madame Two Swords. And so I did a whole stand-up, which is on BBC Sounds, uh, called Help My Heads in Wookie Hole because I decided I needed to find that head because I didn't want it just, you know, getting dust next to Ronald Reagan. It made me feel a bit weird. So I went on this search for my head and no-one would tell me where it was. Channel 4, um, Channel 4, uh, Madame Two Swords wouldn't. Budge. They wouldn't tell me where it was. People had sightings of it. Someone thought it was in an exhibit at Sutton Hoo. 
<laughs> they just put some sort of different body to my head. Um, oh, do you know what? That would be terrible if you just ended up as yeah. a and other peasant in uh, in a museum. Well, I wouldn't mind. I just sort of vaguely wanted to know. That would be so spooky, though. So you're going along to Sutton Hoo. You're walking past the exhibit. Oh, is that? And apparently, apparently, some are kept just in a pile in um, black in the Black Bull. Pool Tower. Apparently, there's a storeroom of heads. Oh, this is the and stuff someone, of nightmares. Someone thought they'd see me there with the crankies. At which point, I rang. I rang Madame Tussauds. So I've got to know. And then the woman from Channel Four Press. Right, I'm sorry. I keep saying Channel Four. <laughs> Madame Tussauds Press just said, "No, I can't tell you where your head is. We never divulge that information. But can I just say, um, I did used to love you on telly, and my daughter loved. And I then thought they've made me into a girl's world. You know, they've got my head." And they're just brushing my hair. She's brushing my hair with her daughter. This is a it's terrible... It's quite dark, isn't it? It's terrible It's very, life. very bleak. And yeah. we're beginning to get a, quite an interesting insight into what goes on inside your head. And I, I'm, I know you've done stand-up. I mean, you've actually... I, I think it's the bravest and possibly most ridiculous thing a single human being can do. Uh, why, <laughs> you, why do you want to do that? Uh, because my, I feel my whole life uh, is a bit of stand-up, really. And also... The anecdotes of my life lend themselves to stand up. And to be honest, the audiences are so warm. I did it at the Backyard Comedy Club. That's where I do all my stand up. And I imagine no one would turn up and it'd be tumbleweed. Honestly, there's queues around the block of just very sweet people who are, f- are full of affection and uh, uh, rather like I'm an old relic, it doesn't really matter. And honestly, I only have to stand on stage and say jumpsuit and people laugh. It's, it's, I found it very. It's a very lovely, warm, in, engaging way to spend an evening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, is it nostalgia that makes people laugh along with the jumpsuit concept? Because, but I mean, we also do need to make very clear: you look amazing. Now, oh. I know we don't want to make a big thing of this because your age is sort of both irrelevant and, I'm afraid to say, quite relevant. Um, how would you get me out of this particular wookie hole I've dug myself? Into? Well, I would ask the question: do you, do you feel a pressure to maintain a certain no. level of? Of perfection, Annika. No, I know, but thank you very much. I'm not feeling that person at all. <clears throat> um, I didn't. That wasn't a relevant cough. I just was a genuine cough. I wasn't sort of clearing my throat, thinking, "Oh God, let's get rid of this conversation." <laughs> um, no, I'm. I'm not into um, anything like that. You know, it's not my area of expertise. I've still got the same makeup bag, largely I've had since I was about 21. In fact, I've even got a Mary Quant lipstick in there. Oh, what colour is it? What shade? Pinking sheer. Of course. Do you remember that? No, I don't no? remember it, but it's lovely. So I, I love the really names. So I haven't really updated. And in fact, on um, it's very sweet because on this series of Challenge, the production team obviously thought, God, she might need some hair and makeup help. I've never had that on any shoot I've ever done, like Treasure Hunter Challenge. There's no sort of makeup lady going, before you carry on building yeah. that wall, could I just powder so there your is, nose? So there is genuinely no one there zhuzhing you up? Well, there was for about an hour and it just didn't work as a concept because, of course, I was never there. You know, it just didn't work. So um, she, right. we, we um, she she went off home after midday on the first day because there was just patently no need for it. And if you look at the program, you know, we're filming in the winter. It's pouring with rain. I've got eighty four layers on. Um, it's not high glamour, is it? No, um, it's not. But it it's is not. lovely, and it's it's a rather joyous show, which is why it was a, it was a success last time. So, um, I imagine Channel Five are hoping for big big well, numbers we've put, this time. Uh, we've put out as the first one a sort of animal sanctuary, it's lovely. Pole farm. Yeah, and I I chose that because I thought it'd be good to dilute me with a lot of dogs. So there's a lot of cute dogs in it. It's which quite, is, which is very lovely dogs. Which is the equivalent of the co-presenter conversation. Yes. <laughs> but after that, I'm afraid it's just me. <laughs> it's quite a line. I'd like to be diluted with a lot of dogs. I might use that myself, Annika. It's lovely to see you. Oh, Thank you very what much. What time is it on Channel 5? In. It's 10 to 9 on Saturday night on Channel 5. Please wear white lycra. Yes. Jane and yes, Pete. well, I always do at that yeah. time on a Saturday yeah, and night. And you don't need a helicopter in order to participate no, in the show. No, not at all. No. Thank you. Lovely to see you. <laughs> Bye.